Well, hey everybody, it's Hudson. In this approach in the scene, I'm coming to you from the side of the road. You're gonna hear some road noise. I'm in my, my big Sprinter van, El Jefe. This is the rig that I spend a lot of time out on photo adventures in. Whether uh, I'm going on my own, I got a queen size bed in the back, or whether I'm taking it to haul people around on workshops. I drive this thing all over the West. Uh, and, and I wanna talk about this time lapse, this time lapse of these clouds playing over the Inyo Mountains in the lower part of the Owens Valley down by Lone Pine, California, uh, on my way into my Death Valley workshop in February that was just really, you know, it, it's kind of a story about keeping your eyes open, about taking advantage of opportunities that you didn't expect to pop up and always being ready to do something with the scene that's out in front of you. Uh, I think road trips are one of the best things that we can do photographically. Uh, and, and, you know, whether you've got a big sprinter van like this or whether you're cruising around, you know, in a, in a, in a, some kind of an off-road vehicle or even, you know, just a small car and you're out with a tent and a, and a sleeping bag or hitting little hotels along the way, whenever we're out running around, I just think keeping an eye on the light, keeping an eye on the clouds is key and having, you know, your camera, tripod, bag handy, just in case something happens. You know, I've always got that stuff tucked in here where I can grab it at a moment's notice. So in February, I drove down to Death Valley. I have a couple big road trips a year to workshops and I always bring the van so that we can all kind of go school bus style from location to location and really get a camaraderie going on the workshop. So I was driving through some pretty rough weather coming down from Oregon. We actually had about six inches of snow in the Willamette Valley. And then the mountains were kind of a rough crossing and then coming down into uh, California, you know, I love the Owens Valley. It's one of my absolute favorite places to spend time and to photograph. Uh, but there was a ton of snow in the northern part, so I bypassed around through Nevada. And I've been driving for about two days, pretty road weary, mostly in kind of bad weather. And, and I cut down Highway 6 before I got to Tonopah, Nevada, to cut back over and go down through uh, the lower Owens Valley. I had a little extra time. The workshop was starting the next day, but I figured I'd still get to Death Valley by five, even if I stopped for some food. And I heard about this awesome barbecue place in a little town called Big Pine that's right in between Bishop, where Galen Rowell was from and where his gallery used to be, and Lone Pine, which is kind of the gateway up to Mount Whitney, the highest point in the contiguous United States. And it's right by the turn to head into Death Valley. It'd been high winds. I was driving by myself, you know, basically for two days. So I was pretty weary. But as I came down into the valley, there was, there was kind of a parting of the clouds. I could see a lot of the, the Sierras. The sun was setting in the west, so the, you know, it's kind of looking into backlight in the Sierras, and there was a shroud, a cloud over the top of them, really heavily backlit. But it was casting a really nice light out across the Inyos, and there was just this crazy storm front that's edge was hanging right over those mountains. And it was creating a huge wind. I actually saw a fifth wheel trailer just blown off the side of the road. Uh, this truck sticking straight up in the air down in the ditch and a big, you know, semi tow truck trying to dig it out. Uh, and they were, I was worried they were going to shut the road down, but, but driving the van really slow because this thing hits a lot of wind. It's kind of like a sail driving it in high winds. But I got down there and I was just watching and, you know, the light wasn't spectacular for the landscape image, but I could tell that these clouds, they weren't doing anything really quickly but they just looked beautiful. And I wanted to see what the motion in them was. And the only real way to even know is sometimes to do time-lapse. And so I thought to myself, you know, there's this barbecue joint in Big Pine that I've heard is fantastic called the Copper Top Barbecue. Uh, it's got thousands of Yelp reviews and still hits like 4.9 stars. So I, I pulled in there, I ordered some, uh, some, some, some ribs, got a to-go plate of ribs with some, with some baked beans, headed just a little bit south to where I knew there was a little dirt road, and I got up off the highway far enough to get a nice unobstructed view of that storm front crossing over the mountains. And I just jumped out with my tripod, set up the camera, put a little neutral density on, and set a, a time-lapse interval of, gosh, I think it was four or five seconds, to just so the camera would snap a photo every four or five seconds. And to get a nice smooth time lapse of cloud motion that isn't sort of jerky, you want to capture about half the time that's flown through your camera. So I used a 10 stop neutral density filter 
from, uh, I, I like my Hoya Solus neutral density filters, you know, whatever neutral density filter you have, but I'd really prefer not using the variable ones because they tend to introduce a color cast, most of them. So I use the Hoya Solus, they're perfectly neutral. I put a 10 stop on there and got a shutter speed of two and a half seconds, even though it was broad daylight and just set my intervalometer to go for, I think, 360 frames. I wanted to get at least 240 frames because if you think about it, when you're playing time lapse back at 24 frames a second, 240 frames equals 10 seconds. And I basically set the camera up. It was so windy. I had my little, uh, my little tripod hammock, the, the, the stone bag on there, and I dropped a huge stone, probably a 25 pound rock in there so that it wouldn't move at all. And then sat back here in the van, just outside the door, ate my barbecue, drank a beer in the sunshine, spent about 25 minutes or so, and just let that time lapse run while I had lunch. And, you know, I didn't even get to see what it looked like until I got to the hotel in Death Valley, got everything unpacked, got the workshop set up, and assembled those images. You know, and, and setting up a time lapse is a piece of cake. You know, if you're interested in it, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll do a video on how to use Lightroom in Photoshop or On One in Photoshop uh, to quickly and easily assemble a time lapse. I, I tend to usually use After Effects because it's a little bit easier and it lets you do some more fun things with animating the a camera moving through the time lapse, but it's real simple to do easy time lapse in, in Photoshop, and Photoshop does a bang up job uh, producing high quality video. The one that I'm showing right now was done in Photoshop. It's just a piece of cake. Um, and you know, all along the trip, I kept noticing opportunities to do more time lapse in Death Valley. Whenever I see big, beautiful cloudscapes or interesting action happening in the clouds, you know, that's my cue. Even if I'm teaching the workshop, maybe sometimes I'll park the car, get everybody out, talk about what they should be focused on, set up my tripod, start the time lapse, and then just run around with people while the time lapse is back at the van running. Um, it's just a cool thing. It's one of the reasons why these days I mostly travel with two big tripods and two camera bodies is one can be doing time lapse while I'm doing still photography with the other one. And, and I just think that the big key takeaway from all this is that you can, you can multitask and keep your eye peeled for good light, for good situations, you know, even when you least expect it. All I wanted in Big Pine in the lower Owens, Owens Valley was to, to look at those mountains and get some barbecue. And I wound up getting a time lapse that I absolutely love. So, you know, always be out there, have your camera ready, use road trips as an opportunity, you know, and, and don't just focus on those epic locations that you've seen photos from that you, that, you're, that you went to go and capture. Look for those little interesting details along the way. Um, and for those that are more passionate about time lapse, hey, hit me up with questions. You know, I, I'm more than, uh, than, than willing to talk about that stuff anytime. You know, I've had some questions about that video that I did recently about the Z6 and Z7 not stopping down in live view and allowing you to zoom in. Um, I think if you just rewatch the video that, that the problem isn't really a problem when you're running around handheld shooting in normal situations. If you think about the old days when we had film cameras or we had cameras before live view where you hit a depth of field preview lever and the lens would stop down. The way those cameras tended to work, when you're looking through the optical viewfinder, the aperture's wide open, so you have a nice bright view through the lens. And if you wanted to see the effective aperture, you hit a, a button and the aperture would stop down and you get a darker view, but you could get a view of what it looked like with the depth of field that that aperture applied. That's what this camera is doing. It's doing a lot better job of it because it amplifies the signal and keeps a nice bright view while it stops down and gives you that view. But the big problem is just that because of a programming decision, they don't allow you to zoom in to the live view, whether it's through the viewfinder or whether it's on the back screen, no matter what, in photo mode. Not a problem in video mode, and videographers need to see exactly what the aperture looks like while they're watching on a monitor. Um, so clearly they made a conscious decision to let it stop down in live view, in video mode, and let you zoom in to see but not in still mode. And I really think it boils down to that autofocus and trying to improve autofocus performance. But heck, Nikon, open it up in manual focus. I'm gonna put that link again in this video to Nikon's customer service. If you're interested in having them change that in firmware so that we can stop down and zoom in at the same time past F5.6, you know, 
drop it in the comments and, and jump in there and send a little note to Nikon. I really hope enough of us will, will, will comment that they think about changing that. It's a simple firmware fix. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look at my approaching the scene video right before this one. Um, please change this Z camera setting Nikon. All right. Thanks everybody. I uh, hope everybody's enjoying the beginning of spring in the Northern hemisphere or the beginning of fall if you're in the Southern hemisphere. All right.